thank you for whoever found page 21. Pursuant to disappointing empirical outcomes for critical incident stress debriefing, CISD, that was the big thing that we were doing like back at Katrina. Um, the National Center for PTSD and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, our friends in Boston, have developed psychological first aid, okay? And, um, and you can get more information about this at uh, ptsd.va.gov. Friends, the VA is a, is a really good resource on traumatic stress work. They do a lot of cutting edge research and they're doing a lot of the cutting edge care uh, that's organized um, from a governmental perspective. And then there's this National Child Traumatic Stress Network, nctsnet.org, okay? Um, there's a manual available at both sites. Uh, that's the Psychological First Aid Field Manual. So you can access that and have that with you if you would like. We're not gonna go through that much detail here, okay? This is responding to crisis in the aftermath of disasters training series videos that I think are available um, maybe through both places for sure the VA. At least it was last time I checked, which wasn't that long ago. It was just a few months ago. All right, so this is empirically supported, but not yet verified, five principles of psychological first aid. So you're getting that? So basically this is, this is based on the literature and based on good empirical practices, but we haven't done this and gone back and accumulated enough data to say for sure, oh yeah, we've, we validated it, okay? And the five steps are this. Number one, promoting a sense of safety. Number two, promoting calming. Number three, promoting a sense of self and community efficacy. Number four, promoting connectedness. And then number five, instilling hope. Okay, just really quickly, promoting a sense of safety. I mean, all that we talked about yesterday, a sense of safety, a sense of stability, right? That's such a huge, huge thing. And basically this is once the, the crisis is over, how do we get everybody to sort of stabilize? So this can involve things like getting food, getting water or whatever else, but this sense of safety. What about promoting calming? What does that sound like that we talked about from an attachment perspective yesterday? Secure base. And I talked a lot about when you have an infant that's upset, what are we doing? We're soothing. Yeah, do you see it? Soothing is promoting calming. Um, and then the promoting sense of self and community efficacy. That's going from all of this stuff just happened to me, external locus of control, to I have a little bit of control and here are some things that I can do. Internal locus of control, right? This is just the big picture stuff. Promoting connectedness, connectedness and attachment. Yep, fits, doesn't it? And it's stilling hope. The hope comes along. So um, there are, yes? Yeah. No, this is acute intervention. You're right. This is acute intervention. So this is a total switching of gears from where we've been. You following me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely right. Glad you brought it up because I wasn't clear enough about it. Thanks, Betty. Yeah. So this is, this is that critical incident. This is acute trauma. It's just happened. Our boots are on the ground. We don't even know yet if they have acute stress disorder much less post-traumatic stress disorder, all right? And so there are these eight core actions of, psych of psychological first aid. The first is contact and engagement. It's initiating contact and establishing rapport in a calm, non-intrusive, informed, and, compa and compassionate manner. I'm having trouble reading, sorry about that. Um, and oh, by the way, so all of this, you don't have to be a clinician to do this, right? You can be any kind of aid worker and do this. So you don't have to, it's part of why I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it in this, in this course. But it's contact and engagement that's compassionate, that's informed, um, that's seeking to establish rapport and in a calm manner. Um, safety and comfort, what we want to do next after we have this contact and engagement, try and address safety and comfort. 
enhance current and ongoing physical and emotional safety, such as giving and clarifying concrete information. This is just like, here's what's happened in the disaster. Here's the aid that's coming. Here's where you can get bottles of water, right? Here's where you can go to get information about potential lost loved ones or the well-being of lost loved ones or missing loved ones, right? It's that kind of stuff. Um, protecting from unnecessary further exposure. So if there's stuff that's still happening, we want to do whatever we can, depending on what the crisis is, is to isolate the unfolding incident and protect the others, right? We're just trying to get them out of harm's way as quickly as possible. Oh, sorry, I didn't click those along when I should have. Next is stabilization, using calming grounding skills like deep breathing or relaxation skills when needed. So if we're interacting with somebody in this very initial way and we see that they're hyperventilating and we see that they're showing, uh, maybe they're looking very dazed, so there's shock or a kind of dissociation there, we're just trying to get them grounded, trying to get them settled. Number four, there's information gathering. As we first take care of them a little bit, next we can consider more the core for all further core actions in order to tailor intervention to the specific needs, risks, and strengths of the individual or community. So once we've got, it, got them sort of stabilized, we'll collect the information that we can that helps us assess and help figure out next steps. This involves identifying problems requiring immediate attention, monitoring high-risk individuals for future intervention. So if we see some or we hear that some have got like multiple loss or a history of loss or there are some other aspects, maybe they tell us that they've got this history of depression or maybe they're telling us or we're seeing that they are in fact dissociating, more than likely we're thinking, okay, these folks are going to need some follow-up care. Identify the target risk resilience factors that can be addressed um, in other psychological first aid modules. And um, so you can go to those, as I mentioned, those websites. Number five, we give practical assistance. We research, uh, the research consistently supports that the loss of personal, social, and economic resources is the greatest risk factor in a mass trauma. So what we want to do is how do we connect them with others that can provide care, medical care, food and water, right? Um, wh whatever it is that we need, we want to reconnect them. We want to reconnect them socially as they're able to others who are going through or have been through the same thing and, um, and economic resources. Um, that's why we in this country declare national disasters and go in and provide maybe not sufficient, but some kind of funding to help economically, okay? Um, so sense of self-efficacy is positively boosted by the practical needs being met so that they're not feeling helpless for too long. Number six, connection with social supports, helping survivors access primary supports and learn how to best engage in giving and receiving support. Number seven, information on coping. So we're not going to process trauma with them. I mean, if, they're, if, if all of a sudden they're sort of talking, we'll sort of be with them, but we're, we're not going to do deep clinical work with them. Our aim is not to do psychotherapy with them. Our aim is to bolster and contain, right, and, uh, and encourage their coping skills. So we might give some information on coping, providing psychoeducation about stress reactions and coping strategies for their, themselves and for loved ones to reduce distress and promote adaptive functioning. So this is very, it's much more educational than process oriented and, and we do it as needed. And then number eight, linkage with collaborative services. And those are the kinds of things that we're doing in acute trauma or acute stress situations. Because we just don't know yet if they're going to develop all those other things that we've talked about with regard to to other forms of numbing, other forms of avoidance, the negative cognitions and the negative mood that follows from that, an ongoing process of nervous system hyperarousal, right? We just, we don't know yet if any of that's gonna come and be part of their picture. So we're not gonna assume it. We're just gonna help stabilize them as much as possible physically, socially, and 
When I say emotionally, that's more like about basic emotional support and basic psychoeducation about coping and normalizing whatever they're experiencing. That's it in a nutshell, right? And that takes on whatever sort of flavor that it will, given what the crisis is and how big the crisis is. And, you know, when the Green Cross and the Red Cross and whoever is there to do the, the psychological first aid. So, right, it's, you can think of it like, just like it's called, psychological first aid. It's first aid. We're not doing the surgery. Not at all. Okay. I know that was really fast, right? Um, any, any comments or questions about it? Okay. Any of you, um, how many, I know Betty has, how many of you have gone through the Green Cross training or some of the Green Cross training here? Okay, Carrie and Lydia. And um, has anybody been on a Green Cross type deployment or been in a situation to provide psychological first aid? No, I haven't either. Um, it probably won't be long before I have the privilege of doing it since we do so much of it here. It's a really good part of the work that we do at Richmond. It's a neat, neat thing. Um, and I love hearing the stories of colleagues and students. Students, is, if they're trained, are able to go. I love hearing the stories of how, what they've experienced and how they've been able to be helpful. Okay. Um, look at that. I got to cross something off the list. It just feels good, you know? <laughs> All right. So uh, where I want to go next is flipping back in your notes to grief. And uh, so we need to talk about grief work. And again, this actually is going to be pretty quick as well. I'm not only going to simply read the notes to you. Um, I'll be a little more animated than that. Um, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, okay? Um, and the primary reason for that is you guys are already learning and will know enough that um, unless you want to specialize in grief work, um, just having good solid clinical training and knowing a few things about grief and bereavement will help you be sufficiently effective, okay? And by sufficiently effective, I mean do good work. Um, now I've just got to find where in all of these notes, can you guys see what I'm doing up there? Yes. So you see my wandering around. Okay, that's where it. So for me, it's slide 55. I know you don't have slides. I don't know where it is for you. Page nine. Oh, yeah. Be yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That sounds right. All right. Um, a couple of things. If I stand up, I'm going to get going. Um, regarding grief and loss, I really, uh, I really, this, this is going to sound like an awful thing to say. I really enjoy doing grief work. Uh, and this is a paradigm for me for a lot of different things in clinical practice. Uh, what I mean by that is people grieve about all sorts of things. They grieve about lost dreams, lost goals, of course, lost relationships, not just through death, but other means. Um, people grieve um, what they thought would be, but didn't happen, right? Which is like grieving a, a goal or a dream. That, um, but in particular, um, what I find is people will come to therapy for their grief when either the sadness of it, like the depression seems to be lingering too long to them or seems to be extra heavy, or when they, and or when they still feel the need to talk about their loss and they feel like it's not okay to talk about it out there anymore. And friends, our culture does not grieve well. We have a lot of unresolved grief and American evangelicalism does not grieve well. So there are a lot of faith committed clients that will come to a therapist and say, just like even my friends at church or my friends at the social club or wherever they're connected, they say that it, what, what in essence I'm getting back in the message from my friends is I should be over it by now and that I shouldn't still be talking about it. And our time frame of support 
and our time frame of patience to let people talk through is really short. And so, um, so I, over the years, I've had a number of clients that will come to see me, even though it's not psychopathology, but because they don't have another place where they feel like it's okay to just be where they are in their grief. And most of them, that's just all they need. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to share with you some models of stages and seasons of grief that I ascribe to, but I hold very loosely. Um, and, uh, and I hold also to the narrative perspective. So we're going to look at like three perspectives. One's like a task oriented, like you have to go through this task before you're able to go to the next task of grief. It's not meant to be a legalism. You see what I'm saying? It's like developmental milestones. And then the other one is, um, is stages. It's the Kuba Ra stuff. And I think it's got some value. And, then, uh, and then, then the folks who tend to be reactive to that with a good critique is like, that's just too reductionistic. Not everybody follows that. That's true. But that doesn't mean that those stages aren't helpful and can't help put somebody on a map. Um, and they say, this is narrative. It's everybody's unique story. Well, yes, there needs to be a narrative aspect as well. Um, it feels like a privilege to me to be part of somebody's narrative as they're working through the loss. Not only who and what they've lost, but it's, it's really vulnerable to them. It's like what they have valued the most. And so they're sharing something really precious with us. Um, so I like doing grief work. It, it feels, I, you hear me say this about different parts of therapy, but it feels holy to me because of like how important this is to, to, to folks when they're sharing. And, um, and so I wish our culture, both in our Christian circles as well as broadly, was much more under, less dismissive. That's what it is, isn't it? We're dismissive and avoidant of our grief. And then we acted out in some other funny ways, like what we see as entertainment. It's like recapitulating our grief. So where it's not okay for me to grieve directly about a loss that I have, everybody thinks I should be over it. I can go see a movie or play a video game or something and have strong feelings about that. Things that make you go, hmm, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, coming back to this, um, grief and bereavement in the DSM-4 um, were separated out from depression. Like if you acquire a copy of the DSM-4 and the DSM-4 uh, TR, you could look up depression and where there's depression, there would be this footnote and like a, like three quarters of a page footnote, right? It's a funny footnote. It's pretty big for a footnote. They would tease out the difference between bereavement and depression. In the DSM-5, they did not do that. There's a lot of debate around doing that. And the debate was, and I can see both sides of the argumentation, that on one side, um, we don't want to pathologize grief and bereavement. It's normal. On the other hand, when, when there are symptoms of depression, and there are symptoms of depression with, with grief very frequently, um, we don't want to um, miss complicated grief and overlook points of opportunities for treatment, whether that's with medication or with talk therapy, or group therapy, or what other kind of support we might give them. We don't want to miss that because we've said, oh, it's just bereavement. That there are times where there's enough suffering and resources that we could bring to bear that we want to bring those to bear. And in our economy and in the system, you can't access those without a diagnosis, right? Like for the average person, unless they can pay for everything out of pocket, they got to carry a diagnosis to be able to get their medication or to be able to attend group therapy or get even just a few sessions with a therapist for some normalization and some psychoeducation and some skill building. You following me? Do you see the, the dilemma? It's not an easy dilemma. So, um, so there was a lot of debate about it and people are really strongly polarized by it. I don't, I don't feel polarized by it. I just say, oh, I get both sides. Okay. Um, 
So um, there is uh, the V62.82, the focus of clinical attention is a reaction to the death of a loved one. So there is that possibility, uh, at least, uh, let's see, that's, that's APA 2000, so that's the dsm 4 tr And uh, what it said is that they may present with the symptoms of major depressive episode, and major depressive disorder may not be given unless the symptoms persist two months after the loss. So the conventional wisdom was that if somebody loses a loved one, and in the first two months, they look like they have major depressive disorder because they're having a depressive episode like lost appetite or really huge increase in appetite, disrupted sleep, right? difficulty concentrating. Um, they may have thoughts about death, but there's a difference in how they have thoughts about death than someone who is what we normally think of as suicidal. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and, uh, and so um, they may be blue and sad for more days than not and most of the day, right? These are all the, so even if they had that, we, what we were saying is, well, if that's happening in the first two months after the loss, that's quite what we would expect. And then there was permission granted for a clinician if they're following those standards. After two months, if they still have a lot of that going on and their functioning's disrupted, lack of motivation, a lot of in, loss of interest and pleasure. And th well, then we can go ahead, if they meet the criteria, give a major depressive disorder um, diagnosis. Certain uncharacteristic symptoms of grief may signal clinical depression. And I'm trying to remember. Oh, I don't have it here. Um, So let me talk about some of those differences. I remember now what I used to do is I used to photocopy that page and we would read that footnote. Uh, I forgot to do that. So let me talk about what some of the differences are. So um, with depression, the negative thinking would be more along the lines of like poor self-esteem. I'm worthless. Um, I, the negative thinking would be um, more like, um, I'll never succeed in the future. And it would be like that with bereavement and loss. It's not, there's something wrong with me. I'm missing my loved one. And with regard to the future, it's not, I don't have a future cause I'm a failure. It's like, I, I can't even imagine what my life is going to be like without this person. Do you get the difference? So just by getting into the conversation, you get to get a real different feel. Both of them might feel blue and sad for most of the day and more days than not in a given week. But like as you start to talk about them, the essential flavor of what's happening here is different than what's happening over here. Over here, when it's just kind of a straightforward major depressive disorder, you have suicidal thoughts oftentimes, right? And it's about like we talked about earlier ending the suffering. Over here, if there's thoughts about death, it's not about ending my grief, usually, unless we've got both going on at the same time. I'm doing an either or, but they can be on top of each other. Over here, it's like, when I die, I'll be with my loved one. That's different, isn't it? Like, I think about dying, and I think about death a lot. Some of it's I'm just being triggered to remember the loss of my loved one, but some of it is, yeah, I have a longing to die so that I can be reunited with my loved one. This is not, and so I've thought about shooting myself or, you know, slicing myself or overdosing on pills. So that whole thing that we did on the assessment before, you start the assessment and you realize like, oh, this feels way inappropriate and way incongruent. I don't need to go here. Okay. Are there thoughts about death? And is that criteria for major depressive disorder? Yes. Is it qualitatively different? In most cases, yes. Okay. Um, you can get lost interest and in pleasure in things, right? That anhedonia in both cases. Over here, it has much more of a hopeless, helpless, nothing ever works sort of flavor. And over here, it's nothing is the same with now, now in the way that my life has been impacted. So this really feels much more situational. Okay, so those are some of the differences. And I think those are the primary differences. Um, there might be negative thoughts, right? But again, this is more like 
helplessness and hopelessness about me. Over here, it's more like, I just have no idea what my future is going to be like. I can't even imagine a future. Right now, my life as I've known it, bless you, is devastated. Okay? So they feel different. Okay? Even though you could click through all of the criteria, loss of interest and pleasure, loss of motivation, disrupted sleep or sleeping an inordinate amount of time, social isolation, change in appetite, change in weight, thoughts about death, right? That's just major depressive episode clicking through the list. You get both, but the quality is somehow different. Any questions about that part of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben. Yes. Yeah, it can. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you can have this present, and then you lose somebody, and then you can see how the loss just deepens the major depressive disorder. Or it can re, like if somebody's in remission with a major depressive disorder, you can see how they have a loss, and then they get kicked back into that being symptomatic. And this can turn into that, but I, you know, that's really kind of rare in this sense for me. Um, and, and let me say this. Yeah, somebody can be in a, and go like lose, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child or a spouse for, that they've been married to and, and go into quite a, a place of depression about it and be just fine. Um, after a long period of time. And when I say just fine, like it's fine that they have whatever period that they need to grieve. Um, and a lot of grief work, by the way, is giving permission to grieve. It's either giving somebody permission to have their grief or helping them get in touch with the emotions that they're not directly in touch with and they're acting out. Remember the definition of acting out? What's the definition of acting out? Did I say it to you all yesterday? I said it to my class Thursday. See, I'm so confused now. See what happens when it's like, okay. Um, you're probably more tired than I am. Um, so acting out, going back to the original language and terminology of it, we often use that term in our culture broadly, as well as in, in the field of mental health for like when a client's being bad, isn't it? It's like this person went, and went on a binge drinking episode, they're acting out. But where that language came from is this, it's back in psychoanalysis that was very developmentally oriented. And it would say this, you know how a child sometimes doesn't have words to communicate something? They act it out in their behaviors. It's why we work to give children words, right? It's why we're working to give clients words. And acting out is when somebody's communicating something that's very strong and very powerful and very important but they're, instead of verbalizing it, they're acting it out. So of course the binge drinking episode or the relapse for the recovering addict is an acting out. And that's why we're curious about, tell me all that happened with that. What got you started going back to that? And, um, and what were you feeling at that time? And when did you first start? And when did it trigger your addiction cycle? We go to all of that. We, we just curious and unpack it all. And we want to learn from it so that they can verbalize next time rather than behaviorally act it out. So that's why in therapy, we want people to keep talking. Play therapy is all about acting out. It is, but it's in play because that's the, that's the communication realm of a child. The younger the child is, the less verbal they are, and yet they still have all the emotion. And so they express it in their play, and a good play therapist not only understands that, but is multilingual and can communicate in the play. You hear that? That's what a good, like I'm not a good, I can't do good play therapy because I, I don't speak that language well. I appreciate it. I understand what's happening there, but to understand, to be able to read the language is different than to be able to relate in the language. You know what I'm saying? And a good play therapist knows how to pick up what, this, what the child is saying and knows how to form in the play corrective experiences, okay? So that's what acting out is. And, um, and so oftentimes we, we will have some clients, especially on the avoidance side, right? This should, make, this should feel like it's crystal clear. Our avoidant clients oftentimes will act out their grief because they don't have language for the emotion. So we're helping them get in touch to process it. 
and the others were providing a space for them to talk and not hurrying them along so that they can emotionally and verbally process. And a lot of times, a lot of grief work is just saying, it's okay that you feel this way. It's okay that you're this devastated. It's okay that it's taking this long. If you try and hurry yourself, you'll get stuck. If you try and avoid it because you think it's not okay, you'll get stuck. If you let it be, it's mindfulness, right? It's what's passing in the stream. It'll be okay. And it, it will pass more appropriately and in a sense more quickly, but the aim isn't to make it quicker. But you won't get stuck if you don't dam it up, if you don't dam up the stream. Okay? Yeah? I'm, I'm wondering about the stigma of like being labeled as probably like a major depressive episode. And I understand why in the DSM-5 they would do that for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, now remember, this is the DSM-4, so this is not the standard anymore. They, there's, no, there's no limit, and it's because of that. And so really what it comes down to, so it's just the limit was before, but after, all they were saying is that in the first two months, you can't diagnose it. After two months, you can. That doesn't mean you should or will. But in terms of then, here they now they don't, if someone is nearsighted, uh -huh. grief work, then they're not requiring you to give them a diagnosis. Well, because of managed, see, that's the thing. Because of managed care, you're not going to be able to get treatment or stay in treatment without a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Totally legitimate. Yes. That, and so my comment earlier that there are plenty of things, there are some things that we have quite right, but there are a lot of things about our mental health system and, 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 and how we operate and the economy of it. A lot of it comes down to the economy of it, friends. And mental health care is not cheap. Um, but no, no medical care is cheap. But that, that it's the only way to make... It's the only way to make sure we have to have a system to discern how and when help is delivered if, if it's resource intensive and the resources are not limitless. And it's grossly imperfect. And one of the reasons why I practice as an out of network practitioner in my private practice is because then I can make those decisions myself and I'm not contractually obligated. And if somebody can only afford what they can afford, I can take them. Um, if somebody can afford more, I'll let them go ahead and pay. Um, and, um, and then I feel like I'm more in control. And then for me, the mental health care that I deliver, I just feel a little more free and a little less captivated by some of the injustices and inequalities and some of the issues in the system. So it's a broken system. I don't know what it's like in other countries to know if other systems are better but there may not be better systems. It's just, it's a mess. It's tied into politics and economics and, right? And I want to close that can of worms <laughs> for right now, for right now. Um, otherwise, you'll see me go into a grief episode and this is not the place. Um, so yes, Kara, I really, res like, you can see how that's sticky and complicated, right? Friends, you are going to have to find your own way to navigate that in a way that you are at peace with in a way that you feel like you are managing what you need for this as a career to be able to provide for your families or whatnot, but also to do the best and have your services be as accessible as possible. So I've always practiced the way I put this. I mean, some of you are familiar with the, with the concept of business as mission overseas. So people will go into places that usually there's not much access for, for gospel ministry and they'll do a business. And they'll also do things that are good just for that community, right? Like for clean water and for cultivating, uh, cultivating um, not the culture so much, but the, the economic vitality of a given place. And, uh, and, that's, and their mission is to do business well that's good for the community and good for the people wherever they're at. But the business has to work enough that it's self-supporting and self-sustaining. 
And then they're, they're just living their faith in that context. That's business's mission. I'm still here in the States, but I operate my practice as a business's mission. And so I like the freedom of being able to choose um, and, and, and have choices. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I operate my practice. Okay, I got off on a tangent. Um, approaches to grief and loss. So we're going to look at this task-oriented approach, which came out of this research uh, by Bill Warden. Bill used to teach, I think he's retired now, he used to teach at Rosemead, which is where I trained. And Warden, uh, Bill Warden uh, is a Harvard-trained psychologist, and this big study that, that he's writing from came from a longitudinal study of following kids who lost a parent. They followed them for many, many years and looked at what were sort of like developmental tasks that were part of the grief process. Huge, huge, really good study. It was groundbreaking in the area of grief work. Um, stage oriented, this is Kuba Ross. Most of us are somewhat familiar with the stages of grief, right? And then, uh, and I'm amazed at how many clients come in and they talk about stages, right? It's just become part of our culture. And then there is this postmodern and narrative orientation. Nymeyer and company have been the ones to talk about this. And this is the one that say, let's not be too reductionistic about the grief process. Everybody has their own story and their development of their own story is what matters. I say yes to all of it. I don't think we have to be either or, okay? We don't have to choose one and deny the others. So let's talk about Warden's um, four tasks of grief. Um, he says the first task in progressing through grief, and notice that he's not putting a time frame on this. So this can take for whatever time that it needs, but somebody has to come to accept the reality of the loss. And if you've done work with people, it's been too long since I've read his study and read his work, so I don't remember how he speaks about this. Um, but, um, but I think this is, so this is like shock. When I'm in shock right after something, the fullness of what has happened has not dawned on me. It takes time for it to dawn on me. And as it dawns on me, then I go from being in shock to sort of carrying the weight of the reality in all of its various ways. And so, once again, I'm not putting a time frame on how quickly somebody has to do this, but I think for most of us, when we have a significant loss, it's like, all of those firsts, oh, they're not gonna be here at Thanksgiving. Oh, this was our anniversary. Oh, all of these things we used to do as our holiday, our Christmas, like, this is what we did every year. And that, oh, he always took care of the bills. Oh, he always took care of the, the garden, right? It's like, it's all of these things over and over and over again, where the realities of what we've lost sort of comes over us in a fresh new way. And there's a process of having to accept the reality of the loss. He says, then we must experience the pain of the grief. If we don't experience the pain of the grief, we're doing what I was talking about a few minutes ago. We're repressing it or we're in denial, we're denying it, and we end up acting it out. So I'll turn, I'm much more vulnerable to alcohol or drugs or other things, right? To numbing out in various ways. And what Warden and friends say is, well, actually we've just, we've got to feel the emotions. And in that, we're, we're really honoring who we've lost, aren't we? It is so honoring for my loved one that I've lost for me to grieve. Next, he says we have to adjust to the world without the deceased. Takes time, but then we have to finally say, okay, this is my new normal and I need to go on. Many of my clients who are, have been stuck in grief have not transitioned to this because they're still holding on to the sad feelings. And the reason is, is their sad feelings is their last or their strongest point of connection. And they feel like if I stop feeling sad, I'll forget. 
or I'm betraying. This is exactly right. You see that? And so when this is where they're at, the reason this is helpful is I want for my client to be able to not stay stuck in the sad sadness, but be able to move forward with life and accept loss as a part of life, whatever that might mean, and still have a sense of connection and holding on to. So, um, what I've done with clients is to ask them, well, what ritual can we now establish? I was going to share one in my family. My emotion surprised me. Um, <clears throat> Because actually, most of the time I can talk about this and it, and it doesn't get me. Uh, but I think the accumulation of talking about so much trauma stuff, and so much lost stuff, it does affect me. So many years ago, um, Robin was expecting our first baby. And we lost that sweet baby before she was born. And the way that all went down was a little bit traumatic, more traumatic for her than it was for me. And, uh, and we had to make this decision, like, well, what, what do we do? Like, she's, she's always a part of us, always a part of our family. And, you know, after, after this dear baby, we had four others. And we want them to know that they had a sibling. So there's two things that we did. We did name her Ashlyn Janelle. Um, and the other thing that we did is, um, this is just the one thing that we do, but we have a little crystal pacifier Christmas ornament. And one of the traditions that we have in the family is every year my kids get a Christmas ornament that reflects something of their year. And when they launch, they'll take their own, right? We always take that crystal ornament, remember her, and hang it prominently right underneath the star, right by the light where it just sort of, you know, the light catches the crystal and it just, yeah, that's how we remember. Well, once we had a, an idea of what we would do to remember, we don't lose her, right? And most of the time I can talk about it and I'm not so stirred up and not so emotional, but it's okay that I am a real human being there. And there's a lot that we missed out. Who knows what family life would have been like with her. With clients, I work with them in discovering what can you do that will be a touchstone for you that lets you remember. For some, it's just as simple and as easy as going to the headstone, right? At the cemetery and bringing flowers or having a conversation. Well, good, whatever they need to do. For others, they'll have other forms and other rituals or other things. But there are ways of not losing touch with a loved one and being able to hold on. Adjust to the world without the deceased, but only after we've let the emotion be what it is and accept the sadness. See it? Otherwise, it's denial, it's minimization, it's intellectualization, it's all that other stuff. All right, number four. Um, finding an enduring connection to the deceased while embarking on a new life. So that's related to the thing that I was just talking about, actually. Um, Adjusting to the new world is, um, is yeah, figuring out what, what will life look like without this person. There can be a new normal. It can finally be okay. Okay. Um, and, uh, but three and four are often connected. And, um, and I have found that people who are stuck in the pain of the grief are stuck there because it will feel to them like they weren't, if they're not still hurting, they, they're not loving anymore or if they're not still hurting, they'll lose the connection. Okay? All right. And so those are warden's four tasks. I think rightly understood, they're not reductionistic. And I think it's our fault if we take that and we're like trying to like ram our clients through the tasks. You know what I'm saying? That actually would be very dismissive to try and do that. But it's out there, right? And in a sense, you got to be careful here but that's how we can be with managed care. You've got eight sessions, right? Well, okay, I get it, but that's not how it works, <laughs> okay? There was a hand, was it Jason? 
Mm. We talked about loss also being loss of job, loss of uh, something else. It seems like you can easily change what we think we're past. Mm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. This isn't completely related, but I do want to say it. So, because um, I thought a little bit ago, gosh, you guys are going to see this in your sleep every time you close your eyes, right? <laughs> like, can somebody get that attachment cone out of my head? <laughs> um, so for someone who's here to experience loss, right? Different than up here to experience loss. I think that's related, Ben, to some of, if I'm remembering correctly, what you said or what your question was. Um, yeah. 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 And even in that, so I just see that as different. And these folks that are going through grief just feel, even their depression still feels different than, than this down here. Do you see what I'm saying? And these folks tend to be really quite resilient. And part of it is because they have other good relationships and good social support. Like, I don't mean this in a demeaning way in any sort of way, but they don't have all of their eggs in one basket. And they're just more accepting of their own emotions so they don't get stuck. And they're able to verbalize and they have continuity, right? Um, maybe as we move into the stages, another good sort of maxim that I think about when I'm working with clients who are going through grief and what, what I'm looking for for them um, is this, that there is, there is this balance. Um, and on one hand, I want to say it's like a tightrope to walk, but I don't want all of like the tension, like there's, you know, you have, like it's so hard to be balanced and you're at risk of just falling over so quickly. But, there, but there, so depending on the person, there's more margin than not. But, um, but the whole thing is when we're walking through grief, like the, the, the tension to walk and the balance to be on is to um, allow for my life to be disrupted by the grief. So if I'm at work <laughs> and I start crying, yeah. I let myself cry. Right, And if I need to, to, to close my door in my office or go to the men's room and lock myself in the stall for whatever I need to do, I don't say, gosh, what an idiot I am. I go, oh, I just need to grieve. And I let myself grieve. And yet, so on one hand, I allow my life to be disrupted. It's okay that I, that I don't have the appetite I used to have. It's okay that it's hard for me to concentrate because I keep thinking about the loss. It's okay that I feel really, really sad. And on the other end, that I don't let this overtake my life and that I live as best and as reasonably as I can moving forward. So I can't, I can't stop making dinner because I have other kids. I can't stop going to work, even though I don't feel like going to work and even though I'm not emotionally present and I would grade my work a D minus, not an A plus, on my productivity, but it's good for me to just stay going to work. So I don't want to be dismissive and in denial about the feelings, but I also don't want to give into like life totally stops. You follow me? And so to the best of my ability or the best of a client's ability, I want for them to be able to give themselves freedom and to, and to keep, for lack of a better term, pushing themselves a little bit. I know you don't want to eat, but you need to eat. You do. I, I know you don't want to keep taking care of yourself, but you need to take care of yourself. I know you don't want to go to work. Man, what, what a huge, you did it. Like maybe A plus right now is that you just showed up. Doesn't matter the quality of the work, mm -hmm. right? And so it's finding that space, okay? And so I'm constantly with clients encouraging one or the other and praising the presence of both, reinforcing the presence of both. Got it? Okay, um, this will make some sense then with Kuba Ross too. So her um, five stages of grief comes from her book on death and dying. It was originally not following people after the death of a loved one, 
but observing the grief of those who were terminally ill. So they got a terminal illness diagnosis and they're starting to grieve about the loss of their own life, okay? Um, and so here are the five stages, denial and isolation. So when people would get this stage four cancer diagnosis, they would be in denial about it. Once again, this is no different than what I was saying a few minutes ago. I'm not, for most people, it's not that they're choosing to be in denial. It's just part of how they're coping and adjusting. And it's just that all of it has not dawned on them yet. It takes time for the reality to dawn on them. Um, for folks with terminal illness, they would isolate some too. When it's like the loss of a loved one, it's variable whether or not I see isolation. But the big thing on this is more about denial, and I think of this as a kind of shock, and I think about this as just a, the process of the reality setting in. Then there's anger, anger that this is gonna happen. Well, again, this is variable in terms of how much anger, um, and by the way, so this is, like this isn't that the person is only anger, angry during the season, but predominantly, they're more angry than anything else, where anger seems to be the strongest emotion in the season. Some will be, have a longer or clearer season of anger and others not. And that's no big deal. If they don't have it, I'm not looking to force it. If they have it, I'm going to normalize it. I'm going to talk about, well, of course you're angry. Especially when I'm processing trauma with somebody. Uh, if it's interpersonal trauma, by definition, somebody willfully harmed them and perpetrated against them. And yes, there should be a kind of anger about that. And sometimes... They need for me to be angry with them and to express that I'm angry with them about what happened, okay? Um, very quickly, a client I had a number of years ago um, who came to me, she did not come for post-traumatic stress disorder, she came for other relational issues. Uh, we ended up processing uh, a rape experience from her adolescence, it was a date rape experience. And she grew up in a fairly religion, rigid religious home and when she shared with her parents, basically she got shamed. And, um, and it was such a big deal for her to share with me because it was the daddy who did the shaming by and large. And here I was an older male. Um, and, uh, and we processed it and I won't go into the details of what I was experiencing in the session. I remember very, very vividly, um, so horrified by the experience that she had. And at the end of therapy, when we talked and I said, what? what seemed to be the turning point for you? Um, what she said was the fact that I was angry, and I was, that her dad had shamed her. That, that the shaming that she received from her father felt more disruptive or more traumatizing to her than the date, date rape did. And the fact that I was, like, I expressed that, I feel angry that your dad, like, didn't protect you didn't like take you in his arms. I, I, just, I just expressed how angry I was about it. Right? I didn't go flying off the handle, right? It wasn't, it was contained, but it was real and she felt it. She said that's what was most healing for her. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Anger, anger sometimes needs to be there. It's an important part. Um, then another season is bargaining. Um, for her, this was more like she would see in folks who were terminally ill, they'd sort of bargain with God. Um, and um, the way I see it in people who have experienced the death of a loved one, the bargaining is more about the bargaining of the pain rather than keeping the loved one alive or bringing the loved one back, right? Um, but even this, I don't necessarily see a lot of bargaining, but on occasion, somebody will do something. I'm trying, it's hard, I don't see it enough for me to come up with a really strong example where I see the bargaining going on, but some people will bargain in a way to just, yeah. Yeah, 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 she's saying, I'll do this. You know, there's, it's like the implicit things, maybe sometimes explicit that we'll say to God that I'll do this if you'll just let him make it through Christmas or to this birthday or, or to whatever. Um, but yeah, Victoria. If I had done this or if I had done that, she kind of felt bad. Like, yes, you're yes. Accepting it. You still want to feel bad and somehow yeah, anyway. yeah. 
Yes. Oh, actually, I think that's quite good. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. You better keep that one, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the bargaining, the depression, this is feeling the fullness of the loss. It's the sadness. It's like my life as I've known it and as I've envisioned it is devastated. It's over. And because I've, I've never thought about life without this person or about this, whatever we're, we're losing, I, I can't imagine going on. All I can feel is the heaviness of the loss. Okay. Then if we permit this and we facilitate the grief, again, a lot of times with clients, it's just like saying, well, tell me what you've been remembering most. Bring in the picture album. Show me your favorite picture. What's your favorite memory? And then just letting them share, letting them weep, and being willing to do it over and over again. Just like how we were talking about processing trauma, letting them do it over and over again, and not being impatient. Our job is not just to try to, to be patient, but if you're a good clinician and you're well attached to your client, what will happen is you'll be looking for the little differences, the nuances, the subtle but significant differences in what they're remembering or how they're talking about it now or how long they're crying about it. Or this, this time it has another emotional sort of layer on top of it. And we reflect that back. You know what I heard you say this time that you didn't say before? Or you know what I, what I felt this time that I didn't feel last time was this. Do you know how wonderful that feels to be heard that closely? When your fear is everybody is tired of hearing me and the only reason why I think you are listening to me is because I pay you for this hour. Mm -hmm. Colleen? I've had a group of counseling clients that came to me uh -huh. um, and they were really a beautiful story and I thought a therapist um, who got a new client and the client was expressing the grief over the loss of her son mm -hmm. and the therapist slept with the client mm -hmm. And I think it was over three about five seconds that she would weep less and less each time the client mm -hmm. would. And mm -hmm. then it was like all of a sudden mm. she, she was fine. She just needed huh. someone to validate her and share in that experience with her. That right there. That right there. It's a lot of therapy. It's particularly a lot of therapy with grief work. And it's holy. It's so cool to be a part of that. Um, friends, there's, there's a lot of school of thought. I mean, some of it goes back to Freud, but a lot of it is how, pro how professionalized we've made this, this practice of psychotherapy. Like, don't let your clients see your emotion. I'm going to swear. Brace yourselves. It's bullshit. Okay. Um, what's important is that we are not, that we're contained in our emotion. And what's important is that we process with our clients what they've just witnessed with us. I was, you probably saw it, I was tearful a few moments ago. What was going on inside of you when you saw my tears? Well, I don't know if I was hiding the look on my face, but I, I was feeling horrified. And I'm sure you read it. What, what did you see in my face and what were you feeling? And then we unpack. And if they start saying, well, I felt like I, I needed to stop because I was afraid that it was hurting you. Well, let's talk about that. Oh, you know what? It, that's not how I feel it at all. In fact, I'm quite glad that you said that you started to feel like you needed to take care of me because my job and my role is to be attentive to you. This time is about you. And then I tell them why it's a privilege to grieve with them and why I want to be able to shed tears with them and how I'm okay. Like, I have my own therapist and I have my own friends and family and I have my own things that I do to take care of myself. And I wouldn't do this work if I, if I was too afraid of getting into somebody's pain. You follow me? Friends, don't avoid. Don't, don't be avoidant. Don't be a blank slate. Be yourself. Be your congruent, authentic self that's reasonably healthy and not bleeding out. Don't bleed out with your clients. And, and, and if you're in a place of grief and you're afraid you're just going to like bleed out, then don't see clients for grief work until you're better. 
I have a colleague who I love. She's so wonderful. She's fantastic. Um, we don't work together anymore, but we worked in a private practice together. And um, she was seeing the wife, and I was seeing the husband in this pair. And, um, and, and they needed marital therapy. And, but neither one was feeling safe enough to go see a marital therapist. They had a lot of financial resources, so they were willing to pay full fee for both of us. Individual sessions once a week and joint sessions where both of us as therapists are in the room, okay? You know, it's really cool to do therapy with somebody else. They, can I tell you, she's the bomb. She is such a good therapist. So many times I'd be sitting in session, okay? And my thought would be, I wanna be your client. I wanna be your client. But of course it wouldn't work because we worked too closely together. We knew each other too well. And I would talk with her about, you are a fantastic couples therapist. You are such a phenomenal marital therapist. You should see couples. And you know what she said to me? She, was, she had just too recently gone through a process of divorce. She had been married to somebody who is not just narcissistic, but I think true antisocial, so psychopathic personality disorder. She said, I can't stay balanced enough. I always see the man as the perpetrator. I won't see couples. I just totally had to respect her, right? Totally had to, but, and I saw firsthand what a great couples therapist she was. And not only would I be her individual client if we weren't friends, like I would go see her with Robin and she could do couples therapy with me and Robin. I, the, she's that good, but that's, that's her stuff, okay? We set our scope of practice accordingly. All right. So after depression, what begins to happen is after a period of time of appropriate mourning, we begin to lose some of those depressive-like symptoms that we've talked about that goes with grief, bereavement and grief. And also people start to envision what life will be like. Like I can have other relationships and it will be okay. I can move forward. We, I can establish new Christmas rituals or even do the same rituals without that person. And there'll be sadness, but it'll be okay that there's sadness, and it'll be okay for me to find more joy. It'll be okay to move forward, start to begin to envision what life can be, okay? And that's the last, the dawning of hope, the reemergence of a future is the last stage in Kuba Ross's stages. So what I wanna say is that it may be cyclical and nonlinear in its progression, right? Um, so you get to one stage and you go back to another, and then you get to another and you go back to another. Um, and um, a lot of it is facilitating progress through stuckness. I've already talked about some of the ways in which we do that or which I try and do that. And uh, you've already heard me say, I think this is a great analog um, for other kinds of loss and grief. So when it feels to me like there's sort of a grief aspect, even though it's not the loss of a loved one, I pull out the grief stuff. So you know what? It feels to me like what we're doing right now is going through a grief process. And I name what it is that I think is lost. And a lot of clients just grab hold of that and that just feels good. It just feels validating, right? Because grief is not, as a rule, there's not the stigma with grief like there is with a diagnosis per se. Okay. Um, okay, I don't have, um, I don't have the other stuff on the narrative. There's not a slide on that because it's really this in a nutshell. Some folks say that this promotes clinicians and society being too task oriented and too narrow in expecting a certain progression of stages in people's grief. And you've already heard me say, but that's not, that's not what this is about if it's rightly understood and rightly appropriated. Um, and uh, when that's the case, it's really damaging. But I think it's helpful to have these as kind of touchstones. And, um, and in this, what I want is, as they would say in this postmodern and narrative perspective is, I want for clients to have a story that has a beginning, that has a middle about that person and the loss of that person. When I say has an end, what I really mean is has a future where they can see now after the, the loss of whatever or whomever they've loved, that there's some future for them. 
And whatever that story looks like and however that loss is a part of their new narrative and their new sense of self and their new vision of the future, that's all fine. But we're helping them have a story, have words for all of the emotions, all of the memories, all that's been invested and now that all that's gone, okay? And you're probably exposed to enough good ideas about narrative therapy. I don't need to say more about that. And that's what we love about our work, isn't it? The stories. Both the stories that they tell and the stories that we are privileged to help construct or be on the front row of their construction of the story. Sometimes it's each or both. Okay? So that's, that's what I got for grief and loss. Any thoughts or questions before we take a break? Yeah, Sydney. Uh-huh. I mean, is there ever um where there's been like Yeah, so the question is wondering about the neurobiological side of it and whether or not there are times like an antidepressant is helpful for bereavement and grief. And um yeah, my quick answer is absolutely. Because neurobiologically, we've got the same things that are happening underneath um, as biological substrates to every symptom. Like every thought we have, there's something neurologically going on. Every feeling you have is very neurological, very biological. Um, and what matters is how we interpret them and the meaning that we put to that. That's the mind part when we were looking at the, the brain, mind, and social aspect. And, um, and, the, and the thing about, so there are multiple places of intervention here, right? We're fighting the battle on different fronts. And what the medicine does is it doesn't help quite so much with the contents of my thought. It helps with whether or not I have enough energy to think or helps whether or not I have the kind of neurochemicals that have me getting stuck in a rut and ruminating or being able to release some thoughts. But the content of these thoughts are still really important. You tracking me? So we need the medicine to help oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes. But we still need also to take care of this because an SSRI, Prozac, is not a happy pill. It's not going to change the contents and the beliefs of my thoughts and how they keep influencing my mood and my behaviors and how those all start to like all work together, right? So um, I always want for us to use medication to the extent that it's helpful. But that's the key, right? To the extent that it's helpful. And it's always in balance with the risks and the side effects of the medicine. And I want us to understand the limits of it so that we're not wanting to use medicine for things that it can't do and where we are still doing all of the things that we can. But I believe medicine is a wonderful and beautiful gift of God. It's a tool for us if we understand what it can and can't do and rightly employ it along with the other things that we can do in order to work towards healing and wholeness and recovery and, you know, wellness. So, um, so whether or not it's bereavement, if I think a client will benefit and actually be able to process better and heal better from taking medicine, I'll broach the topic with them about considering having a medication evaluation if they're already on medicine, having a medication adjustment, and then I talk with them about why. And I talk with them without getting in the role of a prescriber and recommending what they do or don't take or how much. I always tell them to stay compliant with what's been prescribed by the prescribing physician. If there's a concern about it, they can have a conversation with them and I need to equip them for that conversation or maybe I'll have that conversation. That's a little dicey too, right? Tell an MD how to prescribe, whoo, better be careful. Um, so, um, but in that, what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to inform the client so that they're not misunderstanding what this means and that they are as well equipped, it's informed consent, right? They're as well as equipped as possible to make use of the resources that are there for them. Yeah? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, same physiological processes as 
biological substrates. And I, I'd be really hard pressed, I'm not sure I've ever suggested somebody here do medicine, right? It's usually been here. Yeah, I know it's, it's getting to the point where like this is all I have in my toolbox is a hammer and the whole world is a nail. Yeah. I found that like some of my clients who are at on the secure level and neurotic level, it, they will actually like bring the topic of meditating up. I'm mm -hmm. really struggling with my anxiety. These interventions are somewhat helpful, but it's still there mm -hmm. when you think about meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, one last comment about this, and then we need to take a break. Um, and we are running out of time. Go, Jason, and then I'll say my thing. Just quick back to my tape. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, very effective. The literature says that putting folks into group work, you support group or group therapy for grief, is fantastic. Why? Because they know they're not alone. They no longer feel like a freak for feeling what they feel. And also, I'm ashamed of myself that I haven't said it yet. Um, group therapy, when I teach group class, like a test question is about one of the most effective forms of treatment for trauma is group. And that's because people no longer feel alone and no longer feel like a freak for all of these things that are happening in my body, all of these beliefs I have now about myself and about my future all of these things that I'm doing that nobody else do, does, but I'm avoiding triggers. Oh, and somebody else who's gone through something like this avoids triggers too. So we need to take these vets and they need to be in groups. We need um, sexual assault survivors. And so long as they're not, so, so long as they're contained enough and they're not triggering each other, we need to put them in group together so that they know that others share a similar story. Okay. All right, last, uh, there was one other really quick comment about medicine, medication that I was gonna make. And I don't remember it, so we're gonna take a break. If it comes to me, it comes, if it doesn't. I'm gonna get started at five minutes till. Folks, we got a ton to cover in our last fifth hour and five minutes. So just take a really good break. Collect yourself as best you can and be fully present for our last 65 minutes, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> caffeine helps. I, I abuse caffeine. Okay, are we good? Okay, yep. All right, so um, I think it's going to be impossible to cover all that I want for us to cover. Um, so I'm having a little crisis here. I'm going to try not to decompensate. Oh, I do need to pass this around. Will you check off your attendance, please? And... So we've done grief, we've done psychological first aid, we've done suicide stuff, we've talked about the paper. Um, here's what I want to do. Regarding dissociation, I had you do some reading about dissociation, right? You read the stuff in the DSM. All I was really planning to do is just review what's in the DSM. So you don't need me to do um, do you have any questions about dissociation that we should talk about here? Um, maybe to help clarify how it presents or whatever else. Or like, do you have what you need there? Watch this. We've just crossed another thing off the list. So. No, no, okay. Yeah, so I mean, the big thing for me was that I was missing depersonalization and derealization. 
happening in the office with me or clients talking about that happening in their week. And I already said some stuff about that yesterday, how wonderfully patient my clients were with me that I was missing that. Okay. And so um, up to that point, since I didn't, yeah, didn't have a much training in, uh, in trauma and because where I trained, I think there was a bit of skepticism about the realness of dissociative identity disorder. We didn't talk about any other form of dissociation besides like the multiple personality aspect of dissociation. And so I missed the spectrum aspect and I missed, bless you, and I missed um, hitting the, the stuff that I should have been catching or needed to know in order to catch when a client was, pardon me, experiencing depersonalization or derealization, okay? Or some of the fragmentation of the memory, okay? So I just want you to be better informed than I am. And even by reading that part of the DSM, that will help. Now you're alerted to it. And now you know to look for it with this stuff, right? Okay, I didn't know when to look for it. It was just sort of a spooky thing. I didn't get it. Okay, all right, good, we've done dissociation. Um, we, we've dissociated dissociation, right? That's probably, it's probably diagnostic in itself. Um, okay, yeah, let me do this. So what I want to do is I want to race through um, the complex trauma stuff. I think because it's just seeing it as a package, what we've talked about. And I don't think we need to go in depth. If we need to go in depth, stop me. And we'll, we just won't hurry through it. We'll pick up with it next week. But in the event that we're able to get through this stuff, is it still up there? Good. Um, what I want to bring to your attention is if you go into CAMS and you go into our, um, our documents page on CAMS, there are a couple of documents I want to alert you to. One is this uh, white paper by Cook et al. on the complex trauma in children and adolescents. My trauma track people, you've probably read that. You probably had to read that for your uh, trauma in the developmental context course, right? Um, and so this is not a signed reading for you, but in a sense, maybe it is. Because if you read that before you write your paper, it will help a lot with this right here. The other thing that will help with that, and I think this was required reading, I can't remember, but it's just labeled here as D-E-S-N-O-S. -S. It's an article uh, that's, that we're basically gonna review that, the items of that article right now, that looks at what it was, is this was what was proposed to the American Psychiatric Association for the DSM-5 of having a complex trauma diagnosis in the DSM. And the American Psychiatric Association folks with uh, in the, in, in, in the board uh, with the DSM-5 said, nope, there's not enough literature and scientific foundation for us to do this yet. I was really disappointed in that. I like, I don't know what else we need to see. There's plenty of literature and the literature keeps growing and it's already recognized by the international community. It's in the ICD-10. And the fact that we don't have it in the DSM yet makes me wonder if we're not a little dismissive and avoidant of our own trauma. <laughs> Look at it systematically, you follow me? Um, and so, um, but so it's kind of spelled out like you have DSM categories and symptoms and right, in the same sort of way. And so this is what might be if we had an, you know, a complex trauma diagnosis. I don't know. The language we had in the DSM-4, lots of not otherwise specified. I missed that. That was really good stuff. There was a lot of things that you could capture in a not otherwise specified that didn't quite fit perfectly in the other categories. I know I'm speaking Greek now because you all have been trained under the DSM-5. Um, so I want to. I just wanted to alert you to those two things. Look at those those resources, and they will help you with your paper. Okay. All right. Here we go. You ready to go? Sorry, no, I love you, buddy, but I'm not going to get that phone call. All right, my son's calling me. We're arranging what we're going to do tonight after class. That's really important stuff, isn't it? It's self-care. Anybody else feeling a little like emotionally tapped? 
not just me. Okay, good. I'm not alone. There, we had our grief, there, uh, grief, no, our group therapy. Here we go. I'm going to try and run through this complex PTSD, sometimes called disorders of extreme stress, uh, disorders of extreme stress, not otherwise specified. So there are six areas of disturbance. You know how yesterday we put on the board four areas with post-traumatic stress disorder? And by the way, the ICD has this, mostly the same stuff, but they break it into five. When we go from just post-traumatic stress disorder to what we would call complex stress, there are six areas. The first one is this behavioral and affective dysregulation. The second one is alterations in attention and consciousness. Of course, we're going to come back and look at the specifics of these, right? So this is the overview. So first, behavioral and affective dysregulation. Number two, attention and consciousness alterations. Number three, self-perception impairments. Number four, interpersonal alterations. Number five, somaticization. I can never say that word. Somatization. Number six, systems of meaning impairments. You can think basis S. Okay? That's what we're looking for. So let's talk about the first category. This is going to make total sense from all that we talked about yesterday. Number one, the behavioral and emotional dysregulation. We're talking about down here in the cone, right? That there is dysregulation of emotion. That's that stuff that we said sometimes is confused for bipolar disorder, but it's not the weather that's changing. I'm sorry, it's the weather that's changing, not the climate that's changing. It's that rapid change of these global affective states, right? It's activation of their, of their affect. And because they can't step back and say, I'm having that feeling right now, like they just act out the feeling. Anger, sadness, happiness, right? Fear, whatever it is. Then we see the inability to modulate or regulate would be another word we could keep using, anger. So people are having anger management issues. They're saying things, doing things. They're not behaviorally regulated because they're not emotionally regulated. The behaviors follow the emotion. If I know about my emotion and what to do with my emotion, I'll say, oh, right now I want to strangle you, but I'm not going to strangle you, right? There's thoughts in between the emotions and the actions. Anger management, modulation of anger. Number three, self-destructive behaviors. So when we have complex PTSD, we have stuff like eating disorders, addictions, that's both process addictions and chemical addictions that are self-destructive. We'll have cutting, any of that stuff is self-destructive. Of course, suicide attempts and severe ideation, self-destructive, right? Could be reckless behavior. Like, I just don't care much about my life. So I go speeding through any stop sign I feel like, right? So that can look a little bit like mania or hypomanic. All right. Um, this, by the way, can come out in some socially acceptable ways. I know some folks that are kind of adrenaline junkies. Know what I'm saying? Okay. So I'm not dismissing adrenaline junkie behavior as not being this, but I'll prefer it as like socially sanctioned adrenaline junkie behavior um, than something that's completely impulsive, right? Because one is at least planned. And it's within some structure. The other is I have no idea what this person's going to do and when they're going to do it. Okay. Suicidal preoccupation. Thank you. So they're constantly preoccupied with suicide and difficulty modulating sexual involvement. Um, this one is, yeah, it's oftentimes hypersexuality or the other extreme. Uh, and so, um, what's the term that they have for it? It's um, sexual anorexia. Is that right? Is that the word for it? Um, so, it's, it's either one. By the way, they were considering hypersexual disorder for the DSM-5, which is sexual addiction. 
and they didn't accept it. There's an article out there that had it all spelled out for the history and what the criteria would be. Pretty good article. I wish they had included it because as a clinician, boy, do I see it, right? It's there. Um, but difficulty modulating sexual involvement. And, and, um, and folks with sexual trauma, very often, um, I'll say this really quickly. I've never seen a female in therapy who was promiscuous and dangerously promiscuous that didn't have sexual trauma in their history and who didn't start to respect her own boundaries and handle sexuality completely differently and in a really wonderful and precious way once she processed her trauma about the sexual trauma from her past. And it wasn't about legalism and it wasn't about being good, right? Um, I've never had a client that, that came with sexual promiscuity that didn't have that trauma history. Maybe it's out there, but I've never had one. And I've never seen somebody stay in this once they processed their trauma. They have a completely different feel and handling of their body and understanding of sexual relationships and everything else. In fact, very often what the story has been is ever since that sexual assault in college, um, the way they end up talking about it is their promiscuity was their way of trying to make it not matter that it had happened. Try to normalize it. Like if I keep doing this, then that really didn't matter. It really wasn't a big deal. Friends, look at what's happening in our culture regarding sexuality. This happens not only on an individual level, but a corporate level. And man, is it hard to raise children in this world, right? Number uh, F, <laughs> excessive risk-taking, okay? And once again, this can be the adrenaline junkie kind of thing. Um, and so to meet the criteria, had this become a DSM thing, what you would have is you would have A, you'd always have affective dysregulation and um, plus one from B through F to be able to click off, to check off the box of behavioral and emotional dysregulation. Okay, see that? That's the first the next is um, area, the next area of disturbance in complex trauma is attention and consciousness alterations. Ah, thanks. And, um, and either A or B is required. The first is amnesia. What's amnesia? Difficulties with memory. And we've talked all weekend about how trauma affects memory, right? And then second, Transient dissociative episodes and depersonalization. I don't have it on this slide here, but what I, use, what I have elsewhere in the slide deck is for derealization, I'd have this, you guys recognize this painting? It's Munch's um, The Screen. And what I would do is I would blur out everything around the individual, and that's derealization. You're still kind of grounded in your body, but it's like your body has lost touch with everything else out there. And then I have another slide where when I click it, there's an animation and the surrounding stays just as it's supposed to. But what's blurred out is, is the subject of the, of the painting because when you have um, depersonalization, you're, you, you know exactly what's going on out there and, and you have good reality testing. It's just the experience in here is all distorted. Okay, and um, so when somebody has these transient episodes of derealization or depersonalization, it's the stuff I don't know how many times I've had clients describe even while they were in like an assault situation where it's like, it's like I left my body. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking, that's depersonalization right there. And so it's these transient episodes of this. So either some difficulty with memory, and like at what point is it enough difficulty with memory? Hmm, clinical judgment, right? And then some episodes of dissociation. And that's where you have a disruption of attention and consciousness. Can I say this? Individuals with um, complex trauma or disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified also have really difficulty keeping attention. Because all this other stuff is constantly like, 
going on in their brains and bombarding their minds. So of course it's hard to be attentive, okay? It doesn't mean if we have attention deficit disorder that that's what this is, but, but a lot of times that gets diagnosed as attention, attention deficit disorder and it's really this underneath, okay? Number three is the self-perception impairments. And we only need two from A through F in order to meet criteria for this third subcategory. And the first is ineffectiveness. This is inadequacy. I can't do anything where I'm ineffective in life. This is a kind of low self-esteem and an external locus of control kind of thing going on. I'm ineffective. I don't have much hope to get much done or get much accomplished or have success. This also is like clients who tell me, it's not like I wanna die, but I, I just don't have any vision, I don't have any expectation to live past 40. <laughs> any of you have any clients that have stated something like that, may not be 40, but yeah, yeah. Or that I, that I won't, like I can't imagine myself past my teen years, right? So that's an ineffectiveness statement. Um, there was another one as an example that I was gonna give. Is a good example. Um, okay, I can't, can't think of it for right now. Maybe it'll come back to me. The other thought and belief about themselves is I'm permanently damaged. Ever since that thing happened, I'm, I'm, I've never been the same since and I'll never be the same again. Um, sometimes that will come out as I'm unlovable. After, after I was raped, who would love me? Who would want me? Right? Or... Um, just something is different and changed in me. That's the permanent damage. Uh, there's the guilt and responsibility. Even though they are not to blame for what happened to them, they feel guilty, they feel responsible. And they carry that, and there's often repetitive episodes of thinking about that or they ruminate about it. Shame. Just deep, prominent, consistent shame. Um, this one, not too uncommon. Nobody can understand. If you haven't been through what I've been through, can't understand. Well, friends, that's true of all of us, right? No two traumas are the same. And nobody's been through exactly what I've been through. The issue ultimately is, can I understand well enough? But the fact that nobody can understand is usually a defensive maneuver to keep people away and to protect their own emotional and relational vulnerability, okay? Um, and then minimizing, like it's not that big of a deal or it's not, you know, doesn't affect me or it affects me very little. And, um, and this is what I often see with folks with complex trauma histories, especially on the avoidance side when they first come in and, they, and I'm taking their history. And they act and talk like whatever their past is, is it's minimized. It's no big deal. But, you know, when we get into those, remember those three stages, we get into the remembrance and mourning and the grief work of the trauma. Oh, yeah, it matters. Okay. So just because they say it doesn't matter, don't buy that it doesn't matter. Just buy that it doesn't matter that much to them consciously right now. Right. It's a mouthful, but it's true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's the self-perception impairments. And we just need two of those to begin to say, yep, I think this looks like complex stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, area number four, interpersonal alterations. Well, if these things are true in somebody's life, what are their interpersonal relationships gonna be like? A real mess, Victoria says, yes, yeah. Um, and one of A through C is required. So A is inability to trust. In this category, no, because this is interpersonal relationships. But in reality, yes, I think they will distrust themselves. Or they'll have a funny, like they'll say they trust themselves, but it's like, yeah. That's right. Lack of trusting themselves would be an ineffectiveness. That's exactly right. That's right where I was going to go, Victoria. Thank you. That's
that's exactly where that one falls. But this is an inability to trust others. And this can play out in any number of ways, right? So actually we see that a lot on somebody who's really dismissive. So in other words, just they're not gonna report this, you're gonna observe this and you're gonna feel this. Over here, you'll see it all over the place because this will look like what we traditionally think of as borderline personality disorder with that come here, get away thing. Because it's the whole inability to stay stable in the trust. They keep practicing and trying. They're taking multiple reps at trusting, right? Like they were lifting weights, multiple reps at trusting. I can do it for a little bit and that's all I can tolerate. I can do it to this point. Okay, that's all I can tolerate. I can go to this point and I can stay and hold it a little longer and then I'm back out, right? It's those cycles, okay? Uh, Revictimization. This can be either perceived or in reality, revictimization. You get the difference? So with all of this stuff, already you realize how if somebody's carrying all of this and living in this, they're much more likely to be revictimized. Re they're just easy targets. But also, even if somebody isn't taking advantage of them, their guard is up, so they're going to experience people as taking advantage of them. Or they're vulnerable, so they're going to be flooded by the emotion, and they're going to feel victimized again. So it's actual and perceived revictimization. It's just like part of the centrality of their story. And they will begin to victimize others. That's where some of the data on, uh, and I'm not going to quote, quote it because I don't remember the specifics, but the remarkable data on the number of individuals who perpetrate sexual abuse on children, how often they themselves are victims of sexual abuse. This is why what happens in human trafficking that um, a young girl who is um, yeah, taken advantage of and groomed and uh, then um, turned out for tricks and becomes trafficked, how she will end up starting to recruit for the trafficker. Right. Um, this is what happens in borderline personality disorder or other s disorders like it. When they feel hurt, they feel justified in hurting back. And in one one relational way to look at that is it's an attempt to not be alone. It's not just an attempt to 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 bring revenge. It's an attempt to have you be where I am. Yeah. And that's what I think we did to Jesus. That's what we did to God. That's, that's a large part of what I think the cross is about. It's a very broken attempt to be connected, isn't it? Gone all wrong, except for the goodness of God who made it all right. Um, so, inability to trust, revictimization, and victimization of others. Somatization, soma, that's the body, right? With complex trauma, because we are not only psychological and not only social, but we're also biological. We have all sorts of issues, both directly from the trauma, but also from the chronic stress of all of this. So two are required from A through E. The first is digestive system. With all this stuff going on in the stress, you think there's a tendency to have some irritable bowel syndrome kind of stuff going on? Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you think with your body under all that much stress, it's going to have a hard time digesting food normally? Yes. Do you think if you're in this state of existence, right? Sometimes it's a state of mind. Sometimes it's like ongoing, like where we are. What kind of decisions am I going to make about taking care of my body and eating well? Not very good ones. Not very good ones. So I have, I have had clients that come in and they see me during their lunch hour. And they come in every time with a sack of fast food and stuff that's like, oh, I know it's not helping them. Don't say anything, I'm not judging them about it. I'm just recognizing that some of the issues, bless you, that they're describing dealing with and going on, this is gonna to contribute to that, right? Um, digestive system problems. Next is chronic pain. Friends, one of the ways that our pain and our stuff gets expressed when it's not expressed 
appropriately verbally, emotionally, and relationally is through pain. All sorts of pain. Sometimes direct pain, sometimes it's referred pain. What does referred pain mean? It's almost like sublimation, like you're taking it from like emotional pain uh -huh. and transferring it to a part of your body. Yes, 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 yes. We saw, we saw a lot more of this historically um, at the end of the Victorian era, right? And that's a lot of the stuff that Freud was working with. Yep, we used to call it hysteria. Like somebody would have neurological symptoms, but there'd be no medical neurological foundation for it. Freud would work with them. They would process their trauma and they'd recover their sight or they would recover feeling in their, uh, in their hand again or whatever else was going, going on, right? Um, but there are other ways in which I think we have referred pain. And, um, and, and while I never make the claim that therapy will, will help chronic pain, like my chronic pain patients that have been down here and stay with therapy and come up here, I don't know if, if it's truly that they have less pain or they cope better with it, but their quality of life regarding their chronic pain is so much better. I totally believe in the physical benefits of good therapy for folks that are um, suffering and um, have complex trauma in particular. Cardiopulmonary symptoms. Medical people, what are these fancy words? What do they mean? Yeah. Well, like when my nervous system is activated for all of these anxiety attacks that I have and all the times I have my fight or flight activated, eventually that starts to put a stress on my heart. It's affecting my breathing. It's affecting all of these other areas. Um, in addition to that, for these folks, you know how when you get in your car and you start your car and you have the tachometer, it's the RPMs, how many revolutions per minute, it's at a certain level. You press down on the accelerator and it goes up. And when your car is functioning right, it has sort of one level in the tach tachometer where it should be and your car's engine doesn't sound like it's revving. For these folks, their idle speed is up. And there's wear and tear there. Okay. Conversion symptoms. Well, that's we were talking about conversion symptoms just a minute ago with the uh, with referred pain. That's where instead of dealing with the issue psychologically and directly, it's I'm preoccupied with my physical health and I have an issue that even though I go get checked out medically, there's not a diagnosis and there's not a clear thing. Now sometimes it's just that whatever the issue is is not not on the map in standard medical care, but a lot of times there are psychological aspects or can be even psychological foundation or ideology for it. Okay. Mm. Yes, it's more acceptable in some cultures to have a physical ailment than it is a psychological ailment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Excuse me. It's not flu. It's not flu. I'm determined. Okay. Um, okay. And then I think our last one here, oh, sexual symptoms. So, might be anorgasmic. Might be incapable of achieving arousal whatever that means, male or female, uh, might be pain. Um, friends, when we're talking about sexual trauma in the past, it might be sexually transmitted diseases, right? Because those are results from the actual trauma or other things. Like I'm not going to get any more graphic than that, but you can imagine what else can happen as a result. So, um, so we're looking at both the effects of the chronic stress, so to speak, and chronic activation, as well as from the trauma itself, the traumatic event or events. Okay. And now let's go to the sixth and final area of disturbance. And this is systems of meaning impairments. And only um, A or B is required here. 
And the first one is despair and hopelessness. We're going to talk more at the beginning of our next weekend about how important meaning is in coping with trauma. And here, when you have despair, it's like it's meaningless. There's nothing, it's just meaningless. And so there's a hopelessness here and um, loss of previously sustaining beliefs. So whatever belief system I used to have, and maybe I thought there was a God there and that God was maybe good enough, I don't have those same sustaining beliefs that I used to have, okay? That's why I said earlier that I will ask some God questions because it's how I'm finding out where are they doing with this? It's not to push religion on them. I want to find out, well, you used to, have, you used to see God one way. How do you see God now? I'm looking into their belief system and how it's changed, okay? Um, you can see that it's, it, it expands post-traumatic stress disorder, right? We talked about PTSD, and now looking at this, this just expands it, but also deepens it, okay? And that is complex trauma. Um, so the diagnosis is not necessarily dependent on their story or their history, but on these particular symptoms. Correct. Correct. I mean, will there'll be enough of there'll be enough of a story? Yeah, but they don't have to make the connection. They don't. They will not see much connection between these symptoms. And they might not even know that remember the connection. That's right. That's right. Or their story is so fractured, and it might always be fractured. Okay, but once again, that's telltale, isn't it? That means something. So the absence of something can be just as meaningful as the presence of something. Okay, um, um, this, is, this slide here, this statement is what we were grappling with with regard to our, um, our written assignment in the rubric. The symptoms of post-trauma phenomena should be generally regarded as adaptive at the time or immediately following the traumatic events. Like we don't look at that and say, what a freak you are or how pathologic you are because that's what happened. Like that's how your body responded. That's how your mind responded. We see that that fits. It's really quite adaptive that someone who's been traumatized interpersonally that they don't trust so readily. Yeah? Like don't be offended when they don't trust you right away. Um, in fact, really quickly, resistance is just simply fear. We need our clients to be resistant because they're telling us what's important and what they're afraid of. So what happens is if we're trying to bring them someplace or we invite them someplace therapeutically and they're resistant, what they're saying to you, they're acting out, is I can't go there yet. So what that means is the next therapeutic step needs to be somewhere in between. Where can they go? And it might be talking about the resistance. Like I noticed when I said such and such or invited you to do such and such that you said or responded this way and can you tell me more what's going on there or, right? But the whole thing is resistance is communication to us and it's helpful communication because it's what they're afraid of. That's why they're not going there. And it's our job to understand that's what they're doing. And it's our job to work at being safe enough to go to the place where they are able to talk about maybe not all of that at once, but the, the part of that that they can talk about. Did you follow all of that? Yeah, so that like resistance that, that impairs therapy is not because of a bad client, it's because of a bad therapist. It means we're not getting the message. Uh-huh, yeah, so Colleen? One of my clients, I found that it's really helpful um, because she is really strongly faith-based. Mm-hmm. Mm. She gave you in a time where you mm -hmm. were a child and weren't able to handle the things that were going on around you. Yes. She, can we invite that into the therapy room and understand that although that's what you want from me, we can, we can know that now it's maybe not helping you as much. Yeah. Huh. Isn't that a beautiful reframe? Mm -hmm. And so good. Because then they don't have to be quite so afraid, mm -hmm. and yet they also don't have to cling to the dissociation. 
that's the very point here. However, these responses, the dissociation, still cause disruption in functioning outside of the trauma context and contribute to risk for greater morbidity and re-traumatization. That's that place where I was saying, on the paper, we're just saying that it's not pathology, is I wasn't okay with that. We're not using the DSM, I wasn't okay with that because it's not either or, it's both. It's adaptive at some times and in some contexts and maladaptive at others. If it wasn't maladaptive, they wouldn't be coming to therapy, whether they choose to or mandated, right? Sometimes they're mandated. And, um, and we need to walk that line that Colleen was just describing really beautifully of, okay, it's a gift. And at other times, hmm, there are other gifts that are better to grab hold of, right? Okay. All right, um, that is complex trauma in a nutshell. And going back to the paper, this wouldn't exist in a sense for me if this existed already in the DSM. Because instead of having, you might still have a list of diagnoses, but you'd have complex trauma in many cases as your primary diagnosis and your primary conceptualization, and it would be trauma and attachment informed, which just means it's trauma and developmental informed. And then that would frame what you're doing. You see that? But because this is not in the DSM, and it's new, new enough to a lot of areas of practice, we're doing this so that you can say, yep, I get this, and I understand where it comes from, and I know how to conceptualize with a client, and I have a little bit of an idea of what I might do with the treatment in light of that. Okay? Does that help? Okay. And you know what's really cool about this? I mean, I know this is gonna be so, this is gonna sound like I'm pitching for Richmond, but <laughs> friends, I don't, I don't know any, except for Wheaton, maybe a little bit at Regent, most master's level programs do not teach this. They don't get into this, and they're not this trauma-informed. And all the more, those of you that are going to walk away with a trauma certificate or go back for it. It's the same thing, by the way, for the other certificates as well. So this is something that I think is really unique. And when I had the opportunity to come back to Richmond, I was so excited because I wanted to be where we were doing the stuff that was most important and kind of cutting edge. And that's here. That's here. Um, and I feel that way about how we handle integration as well. So we don't handle integration perfectly. We've got a long ways to go. But many Christian institutions out there will teach from a Christian perspective, from a Christian worldview, but don't necessarily teach you how to integrate. Again, I know we've got a long ways to go, but you're taking additional courses that will help you think and operate integratively that isn't just sort of being a Christian that does therapy but isn't quite sure what, and integration is a lifelong endeavor, but there aren't a lot of places out there that actually do integration. They just teach from a Christian worldview if you get the difference. Yeah, yeah, so it's cool. I just, I love to be with you guys because you like that stuff and that's why you're here. And if you don't like that stuff, don't tell me. I'm happy in my little world. I'm happy in my little world. Okay, we have 24 minutes and here's what I wanna do. First, I need to ask, is there anything else about this that feels unclear, that feels like we should talk about? Going once, going twice, you are as numb as I am, sold. <laughs> All right, would you like to see the case study for the paper? Okay, um, I'm gonna divide this into basically three, Probably needs less on this side. Uh, I'm going to go over here because people in the middle, maybe it'll make its way to the back. I'm just guessing on the number here. Victoria, will you take this and spread back? All right. What I want to do is um, if we had more time, we would do more of a group case consultation but you're gonna get faculty case consultation, okay? Uh, and maybe the best thing about that is it's the same faculty member who might be grading your paper. 
Um, let's read about Carla, okay? And let's see if we can talk about some things along the way. It's both helpful and a little harder that there's so much information here, yeah? But let's just jump right in. Let's see how far we can get. And then this way you can get your paper done. And um, yeah, and that'll feel good, right? Okay, see you don't wanna write this paper too late from now because all this stuff is fresh, okay? Carla is a 38 year old married Caucasian female who initially sought mental health services with her husband of 14 years, so they've been married for 14 years, Jack, for marital therapy due to marital discord and poor communication. And that was their report, like why are you here? Poor communication. At the time of intake, Carla had three children between the ages of six and 12 years. At the start of treatment, Carla was a homemaker and was active in the PTA and in various services and women's ministries in her church. She sounds kind of high functioning, doesn't she? Carla and her husband are professing Christians with a meaningful spiritual life. She spoke of these activities and the corresponding relationships in a dutiful manner, lacking animation or sense of connectivity or vitality. In contrast, she did seem engaged and emotionally attuned to her children. She reported no hobbies for herself. So you think about interest and pleasure here, right? Um, Carla seemed likable, committed, and reliable, but not passionate about the activities and relationships of her life. Carla had many acquaintances and seemed well-liked in her community, but when her therapist inquired about confidants and soul friendships, Carla responded with a shrug of her shoulders and a look that appeared both empty and slightly puzzled. like. What the heck are you talking about, right? What are you thinking in terms of attachment style so far? Yeah, thinking avoidance so far. Inquiry into Carla's history revealed that Carla has two older brothers who are 12 and 14 years older. That's an interesting family dynamic, right? It's almost like she's an only child. And she is indeed the only girl. Her father was a salesman who frequently traveled away from home. Thinking about that? And the therapist's impression was that he was emotionally absent even when physically present in the home based upon Carla's few vaguely recounted memories. What are you hearing there? Okay, so there's memory stuff that should be catching your attention. And remember the adult attachment interview? What, what, what is the quality of her response? Is it specific? No, it's vague. Is she producing a lot? No. So when you have vague and it's fine, what are we thinking? Avoidant. Avoidant. Very good. You guys are going to knock this out of the park. This is going to rock. Carla's family of origin sounded middle class, similar to her current socioeconomic status, which is important because there's a lot that's related to socioeconomic status, both in the past and development, but also currently, like what her resources are for help. And I don't just mean like financial resources and her education. Her mother was an alcoholic who also attempted to overdose on sleep medication when Carla was 12 years old. Carla was the one to find her mother unconscious, discovered her mother's suicide note, and called 911 for emergency medical assistance for her mother. She said she, quote, hated, unquote, the ensuing family sessions while her mother was in intensive inpatient treatment. Okay, who would hate the family sessions? Like being forced to talk about this stuff in a relationship and talk about emotions? Okay, right? Does it, so, so things are kind of hanging together, right? Carla stated that her family life was otherwise <laughs> typical. Like, yeah, if it wasn't for that, Everything would be just fine. Okay, but that feels like everything. Yeah? Okay. Next paragraph. These are real cases, but names, of course, have been changed, and some things have been changed so that you couldn't track them down, but this is, this is truly what presents in therapy if you haven't done therapy yet and you're getting ready to. It's fun. It'll be good. Hang in there. You'll love it. Carla also described with minimal emotion and vague, and by the way, these are some of the hardest clients, so... Well, no, I mean, just sort of like this sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 at least for like outpatient stuff. Carla also described with minimal emotion and vague generalizing language being the victim of a sexual assault when she was a junior in college. 
She said she had attended a university athletic event and foolishly, self-blame, thank you very much, walked alone to the bathroom of the vacant neighboring ball field, not wanting to wait in line for the women's bathroom at the field of the game she was attending. You have the scenario in mind? Ladies, have you ever gone to another bathroom because you were tired of waiting in line? Men have no idea what that's like. We just don't, we don't have a clue. And would you not? Be at one ball field. You know how it's like. They have all those ball fields together. And there's a line at this one because there's a game here. But the next field is vacant. And there's an outhouse. And you go to that. Like, is that unreasonable? No. Hmm. Yes. Thank you. It's not. It's not. It's not necessarily foolish. She was assaulted in the ladies' room by a Hispanic male in his mid-20s. Carla stated that she saw a therapist at the University Counseling Center for, quote, a handful of counseling sessions, unquote. She stated that although she was initially very, quote, messed up, unquote, by the assault, she was, quote, fine again, quote, love that, after meeting with a counselor, quote, a few times. When Carla's therapist asked questions for clarification about the events of the assault and her subsequent treatment, Carla replied, I'm not sure. It's just a blur now. It's just something that happened a long time ago. I wouldn't have said anything about it if you hadn't asked specifically about any, counts, any counseling in my past. Do you get this? So as a therapist, you say, well, have you ever had any counseling before? And she says, yeah, I had a few counseling sessions when I was in college. Like, okay, wait a minute. That's not just a few counseling. There was a sexual, there was a rape, right? So there's a big deal. And so do you see the minimization? Okay. I am giving you the paper, giving you the paper. Carla had naturally attractive features. However, her physical presentation was noticeably plain and her grooming was seemingly unremarkable, even unnoticeable. What's going on there? Not, yeah, draw, not drawing attention to herself. Like, does that fit? Does she want to be seen as beautiful and attractive? Even if she has this like natural beauty about her? No, why not? She's too vulnerable. Who knows what's going like, to happen? Carla was slightly overweight, but by no means morbidly obese. Her style of fashion was plain but coordinated. She reported good health apart from episodic irritable bowel syndrome. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Which was diagnosed by her primary care physician a number of years ago. Generally, her speech seemed within normal limits, except that her tone seemed quiet and almost passive. She was honest and forthright, yet interactions with Carla carried a sense that she did not share too vulnerably or connect too deeply with her therapist. The therapist cultivated sufficient rapport for effective therapy, yet the therapist was aware of her own ambivalence. Inside of the therapist, the therapist longed for a deeper sense of connection and was also frustrated at how elusive the sense of connection with Carla seemed. You can almost like, you almost feel what it's like to be in the room with Carla right now, don't you? Okay. Let's turn the page. Jack described their marriage as having been, quote, functional, unquote, yet lacking, quote, spark and passion, unquote. Okay. He bemoaned Carla's lack of libido, and he was growing frustrated with the, quote, miles of space in between them, unquote. Okay. This might be numbing right? It might be sometimes a little bit dissociation, at least emotional dissociation. No, that he's describing experiencing with Carla. Okay. He stated that while he was not particularly happy in his marriage, it was at least tolerable until about six months ago. Huh. Tell me what happened six months ago. He described Carla as a good woman and insisted that he genuinely loves her. The therapist noted to herself that the timing of the increased distress that six months ago coincided with their eldest child, a daughter, turning 12 years old. Oh, Ben, well done. Was that you, Ben, or was it Thorne who said mom's suicide? Yeah. Friends, this happens all the time. People start to manifest stuff from their history when their kids reach the age that they were, they were when the stuff happened. It's just, a, it's just like a thing that happens. It's like now that my kid's that age, it awakens something in me, either consciously or unconsciously, because I can't imagine the kid who I love, either my doing that 
to her, to my child, or my child just having to endure that, right? Okay. That often starts unconsciously but becomes a conscious thing. The daughter began excelling in softball. What do you hear there? And started playing on a competitive traveling softball team and practices many nights a week and has frequent tournaments on the weekends. That's right. Here she is. All of these ball fields. Are they potentially triggering for her? Yes. Carla and the rest of her family have been spending a lot of time at ball fields the last six months. Hmm, six months is making sense now. Neither Jack nor Carla seem to draw a connection between the emergence of Carla's symptoms and those recent events. Like it didn't dawn on them that it had to do with the fact that they were at the ball field. And remember, Carla's nowhere thinking, she's so detached from the rape, she's like, oh, I just went to counseling a few times. She didn't even talk about the rape until we asked her if she had counseling before. Do you see how minimized it is? Yeah. So they don't make the connections. We're the one that sees the connection and we can't just say it to them. You say it to me, but as they have tolerance, we help them draw the connections because we don't want to create it for them, but we want to help them discover it, right? Carla and the rest of the family have been spending a lot of time, oh, let's see. Jack recently expressed consideration of a residential separation due to Carla's recent outbursts and anger at him in, in front of the children. Anger at a man. Outbursts of anger toward the children, okay, so there's stuff with the kids, and their eldest daughter in particular, who's 12, for minor infractions, for general, quote, roller coaster of emotions, unquote, and numerous hours of squandered, um, hours now squandered each day and playing solitaire on her smartphone. This, this is the mom who's got the dysregulation of anger, who's an emotional roller coaster, according to the husband's description and numbing out playing solitaire on her phone. Adding, I just don't know who she is anymore. So Jack is saying, she's not the same woman I used to know. And this last six months have been almost intolerable. Jack, so do you think Carla is coming to therapy because she wants therapy? No. no. This is marital therapy precipitated by her husband. Jack declared with bewilderment, Quote, I feel like we are all living on eggshells or that she is a ticking time bomb. Huh. But we don't know why or when things will explode. Unquote. Carla has been neither physically abusive nor neglectful in any discernible way toward her children. But Jack fears she may escalate to this level. Like he has no idea because of her dysregulation what she's capable of yet. Okay. This is not made up. After this, like what we've been talking about this weekend, there's nothing surprising about this, right? Lots that's sad, but nothing that makes you say, huh, I want, that doesn't make any sense. And, and this case was not written for this assignment. Okay? This is just a case write-up. Carla stated that she feels very insecure about the possibility of residential separation. What's happening there with an important attachment figure? Activation of her attachment response, right? Believing it will inevitably lead to divorce, she admitted some active suicidal ideation, including fantasizing about possible methods. She denied having acquired means to complete a suicide attempt, nor did she endorse suicidal intent. So you got a little bit of the pimp going on there, right? She had no prior history of suicide attempts herself, she readily agreed to a suicide contract and she expressed self-loathing for and some fear about her suicidal ideation. She feels like a bad person for feeling suicidal. Recalling the impact of her mother's suicide attempt on their family. So previous history, yeah, big time. She also said that she doesn't know what is happening to her. She fears she is having a breakdown her word, or simply, quote, going crazy like my mom did, unquote. Last paragraph. Over the course of the first few sessions, the therapist discerned complaints of disrupted and non-restful sleep. Carla said that she has started to have nightmares a couple of times each week. She awakens from these nightmares in a sweat and in a physiological state of panic. However, she often does not recall or make sense of the actual content of the dream. So she doesn't remember the dream. She just wakes up and this is what she's feeling. 
Additionally, Carla often displayed psychomotor agitation in session. Do you know what that is? It's like that shaking of a leg or some kind of fidgeting. So there's constant motor activity. Typically, shaking her left leg whenever conversations moved towards tones of deeper affect or topics of vulnerability. What that means is when it starts to get a little bit deeper affectively, then there's, she starts to shake that left leg. Um, she complained of difficulty concentrating. So is that somatic in a sense? Yeah, very much. The body's communicating something that she's not communicating with words. She complained of difficulty concentrating and regular bouts of fatigue. Carla was frustrated with herself for obsessing about the conflict in her marriage, as well as for alternating times when she felt spacey and blank. She stated that she often feels sick to her stomach at her daughter's ball games, things that make you go, huh? And that the games make her edgy and tense. Now, given what Carla knows, she's just interpreting that as how. Based on what you know about Carla, what do you think is going on at the ball games in her interpretation of being edgy and tense at the ball field? She's not connected to, to her trauma, so what is she going to connect it to? Her daughter, like her daughter's performance. Like, I'm just nervous about the game. Or I'm nervous that my daughter's going to get hit. Or I'm nervous that, right, whatever it is. Carla explained that she gets nervous for her daughter and the whole team of girls before and during their games. However, Jack added that she seems to spend more time, quote, watching the crowd than she does watching her daughter play softball. What is that? Hypervigilance. Excellent. Do you see it? So is she distracted? Yes. But, but does she, can she consciously make the connection yet? No. Okay. If you have the DSM... You have one way to read through all of this. And maybe or maybe not PTSD. I mean, you sh it should be a rule out at least. Um, but with the trauma developmental spectrum and disorders of extreme stress or complex trauma, this looks and feels completely different, doesn't it? Now, there's a lot kind of emotionally overwhelming, but is anybody conceptually overwhelmed with all the data here? Uh, Victoria is. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that you would say not so much. <laughs> this is what I'm going for, yeah. right? right? If you're not looking for just simply traditional post-traumatic stress disorder, but you're looking for these other things, it's like almost everything mm -hmm. has a proper place to fit on the Christmas tree. They're all ornaments that fit on the Christmas tree, right? And that's what you're doing in the paper. So with the five minutes that we have left, we do need to talk about this. You already know, of course, you're going to write her up in a particular way about where she falls here in the disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified. So you need to make a good case why that's, that's what this is. Actually, maybe... There's a sense that that needs to be here in number five. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, let me, let me think about that as we talk about this before I let you go. What other DSM sort of things are you thinking about are present? Are you thinking about any mood disorders? Okay, mood disorders. Now you're gonna have to look at the DSM-5 criteria and read through this and see how much is there. And if it's there, give her the diagnosis. If not, but you think it might be there, you give her a rule out. How many of you have not yet or are currently in the psychopathology class? Raise your hands high. Okay, you folks need to, in your paper, let me know that that's where you are. Your first statement on the paper, you need to let me know that you have not completed the psychopathology class because I'll give you more latitude, okay? The rest of you, you're already supposed to be experts. <laughs> okay, so if the criteria is there, give the diagnosis. If it seems mostly there, or you have good reason to think it's there, put the diagnosis with rule out. What that means is you're going to get more information and either rule it in or rule it out. So maybe you're thinking mood disorder and major depressive disorder. 
What else might you be thinking of with her case? Anxiety, anxiety disorder. Do you know that post-traumatic stress disorder used to be an anxiety disorder? But they decided to move it out because of all of the anxiety features, right? Haven't we talked about fight or flight all weekend and freeze? But the reason they moved it is because it's got a clear starting etiology of a trauma, okay? But you might be considering some other anxiety disorders here. You look at what's in the DSM, see if it fits. If not, okay. And it might be it's better explained by post-traumatic stress disorder. Will you be looking at post-traumatic stress disorder for her? Yes, you should. Well, um, acute stress is within 30 days. Does she have a 30-day trauma? I just ruled out acute stress disorder for you, okay? You might be considering a dissociative disorder, right? If she's got it, give it. If she doesn't quite, put a rule out. What a rule out means is you're going to ask more questions. You're going to collect more information until you can say reasonably sure one way or the other. Might you consider a personality disorder? Some are saying yes. Yeah. Courtney, do you have one in mind or you're just saying you think you might consider it? Okay. Yeah. Gosh, somebody should write a book with that title. <laughs> they already have about borderline personality disorder. So you probably know that. So there's that. Any others that you might consider? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, good, Colleen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. Any others that you would consider? There doesn't seem to be drug and alcohol in this case, right? Um, okay. Well, I mean, I don't know the cause for it, but like because of the mother attempting suicide, that could be possibly potential from the you know of her health symptoms. I mean, I was going to say that might include the alcoholism from the mother if you have a person stressing and just that. That would be cool with the symptoms of the one you don't want. Okay. All right. You know, I think her rule out just could be that the um, she remembers sorry, that she was also considered a mental disorder and just that features. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think she could be considered that too. Okay. And so here's what I want for you to know. What I'm looking for in this paper is that you're considering the major stuff well enough. Um, different clinicians will assign different diagnoses. But I just wanna see that you're seeing the big stuff and that you're thinking through well enough. That's why you have to give me this paragraph, set of paragraphs. It's gonna be a set of paragraphs, right? Because we just talked about a bunch of stuff. Where, by the way, again, this is not gonna be like a storybook narrative. This is gonna be, you're, in your paragraphs, you're gonna be listing a number of symptoms that correspond to the diagnoses, okay? In fact, in this, you can conflate these by saying, um, you know, Carla evidences, and you go through a list of things that reflect a mood disorder of, and then tell me what that is. And then in your next paragraph, you go through the things that an anxiety or dissociative disorder, or whatever, okay? But you just got to spell it out kind of plainly, all right? And these things will go together. And, um, and so here's what I want on number five. Um, I do still want for you to say something really briefly about a level of functioning and maybe something like how this informs how you'll treat her. We didn't go into details about that, so there doesn't need to be a lot about that. But I do want here, like put in like three and four B before you get to number five is if Disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified, what we just went through was a DSM diagnosis. Pull it all together right there. So what of, we went through six domains, right? And she has to have A and one of B through F. Tell me if she's got that. Tell me if she's got either A or B of number two. 
Tell me if she's got all or just a couple of the three of, of the third domain. Are you following me? So what I'm asking you to do is consider this as now as if it was part of the DSM so that you're pulling this all together to say either conclusively she has complex trauma, that is to say disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified, or no. Okay. Yes, Courtney, and then Ben. Yeah. So keep this as best you can to eight pages, right? Because Oh, you mean this for the criteria? Well, so maybe the way to do this is give me a paragraph on what you're thinking with regard to mood disorders. And that doesn't have to be long, right? Like this is just what symptoms do you see from her case that correspond to mood disorder if you give her one? Or give me a sentence of why you didn't give her one. Um, for anxiety. We've talked about um, dissociative. I forgot what we call it now in the DSM, but it's um, the trauma and stress and whatever other stuff you might add. So, um, but I don't want this, the, the point about it is I don't want this to be wordy, right? I want you to be as precise to the point as possible. And you're only saying, you know, and it's going to be list-like, but in a paragraph form that Carla demonstrates and you go through the things of a major depressive episode. This, 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 and this, which would suggest a major depressive episode for major depressive disorder. However, it falls short of the number of criteria, so it's, so it's a rule out. You see that? So that doesn't have to be a whole page. You, you can do that in about a paragraph. I really want you to be succinct, okay? I, what I'm looking for is, I'm not grading you for your writing. Your writing needs to be graduate level. But I'm not grading you for your writing so much as I'm grading you for your thought process and your application of this stuff. Okay? Uh, ben, I think your hand was up and then we'll come back. Angela. That one. Okay. Yeah, Angela. Say that one more time. For the differential diagnostic criteria, can you list it in paragraph one and four? The differential diagnostic. Uh, I'm trying to imagine how that would look. What I want to say is yes, because I don't. Oh, do you have it sort of like. Oh, yeah, that would that would work fine for me. Carla is the client. Any other? Yes, Sherilyn. This is just like a really kind of general guess as to that. Yes, I can do that. Um, so let me write in this one other piece so that I can take a picture of it and make sure I'm sending you exactly what I've told you here. Um, Any other questions? Um, today is the 13th. I'm sorry, the third. Uh, and you all are late. Oh, remember to upload your reading reports. I did open cams for all of you. Um, let's do this. Let me give you until the... 18th, right? So I'll have it due on the 19th. That gives you two weeks. If I give you much more time than that, this is all going to get too fuzzy. Okay? So let me write down. And then I'm going to take a picture of it. Anything else? What's that? Oh, 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 you want me to go back? Was that not in your notes? Okay. Oh, yeah, you guys don't want my email, do you? Okay. All right.
Great job, everybody. It's amazing how much ground we've covered. Well done, I'm really proud of you, and I'm looking forward to reading your papers, and I'm looking forward to our next weekend together. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Oh, thanks.